All right, Ephesians 4, 1. Let me read this to us today. It says this. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Here's the main idea today. Christians must live a life worthy of our high calling. Christians must live a life worthy of our high calling. We must live a life worthy of our high calling. In other words, our Christianity should reach into everything that we do and should change us in real life, not just in our minds and our hearts, but in everything that we do. We'll start with this phrase, the calling to which you've been called. A calling is an important concept in the New Testament. The Greek word here is klesis, and it means an invitation to experience a special privilege or responsibility. And that's exactly what the gospel is. By God's grace, he has invited us to be his sons and daughters and to live in the light of his goodness and to be his ambassadors and representatives. And it is a privilege and it is also a responsibility. And so because of that high calling, we must walk in a worthy manner. There's this weird idea out there among some Christians that Jesus is just sort of a get out of jail free card that you just come to Christ and then go do whatever you want. You feel better about yourself, but it doesn't really matter anymore because he'll forgive you. Or this idea that the gospel is just a radical tolerance where everybody just has to accept everybody else's sin and lifestyle and behavior and whatever else. Like the cross somehow cancels out morality in certain areas of life. But that is not right. That's not right. We are meant to be forgiving because we have been forgiven. And we are meant to be tolerant because God has been patient with us. But the gospel is not just a call to the privilege of God's grace. It's a call to the responsibility of godliness. That there is a real right and wrong and a real morality and immorality and there's a real good and evil. And the cross, rather than cancel those things out, shouts them to a lost and sinful world. The cross is the foundation and the solidifying of the fact that there is a real right and wrong. The death of the Son of God for sin is a certain proof of that. And the grace of God then calls us out of sin and into good works. It's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. By grace you've been saved through faith. God's grace, our faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. And so there is this worthy manner in which we who have been rescued by God's grace, made new in Christ Jesus, should be walking. And then he goes on to describe for us what that looks like. And I think there are four main things that I want us to focus on today. What makes a worthy walk? What makes a life that is properly lived in the light of the grace of God? The first thing is a worthy walk, number one, is humble. It's humble. A worthy walk is humble. He says we should walk with all humility. All humility, not just some, all. And humility is the opposite of pride and arrogance, right? It's the opposite of self-importance and self-righteousness. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
But humility is also not necessarily debasing or dishonoring yourself. That's not the idea either. Humility and humiliation are related, but they're different. God is not calling us to discard our identity or ourselves and to just allow ourselves to be run over by any and everybody. That's not the idea. It's also not a call to any kind of self-hatred, right? He says to love your neighbor as yourself. It's also not considering ourselves to be unimportant, just that we consider other people to be important as well. Listen to this instruction from Romans 12, 3. I think this captures the idea of humility in the Bible really well. He says, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So he's not saying think of yourself as the lowest of the low. He's saying be honest with yourself about who you are. right? That you are a sinner, but you've been saved by grace. That you have certain gifts and abilities, but so do other people. That your life matters and the things that you need and want matter, but other people's lives matter too and so do their needs and wants. That we should consider ourselves fully, our flaws, our strengths, our sins, our victories with a kind of sober judgment so that we can empathize with people who are suffering and struggling and we can celebrate their wins and grieve their losses with them and we can enter into the brokenness of the world around us, not as a judge, but as a helper. And we can become a proper ambassador of the God who willingly entered into our mess and laid down his life for ours. That's what humility is. And it's a part of living a life worthy of our calling, that we would humble ourselves before God and other people in an honest recognition of our own value and theirs. Because we aren't the center of the universe. That's what humility recognizes, that I am not the center of the universe. God is. And I don't have all the answers and I don't have it all together and I'm not perfect and I'm not worthy to condemn other people or to stand above them. And so because of those recognitions and that frame that the gospel puts on our lives, we should do all that we do with humility. We should be humble. And connected to this is the next descriptor of what a worthy walk looks like. And that is we should be gentle, a worthy walk is gentle. So he says, all humility and gentleness. This is the same word used for the fruit of the spirit of gentleness in Galatians 5. It's prautes, and it's related to humility. But it's sort of like the outworking of humility. It's the actions that flow from a humble heart that tend to be gentle. And gentleness doesn't mean weakness or cowardice or being soft. Or anything like that. That's not the idea. We're not talking about somebody who's a pushover. The idea of gentleness is strength under control. And that is deeply related to humility. In fact, sometimes this word prautes can be translated as courtesy. Which I think is interesting. Because this idea of gentleness is bigger than just physical, right? It's, it's social. It's emotional. It's every aspect of us can be gentle or harsh. And gentleness hears people out, for example. And gentleness allows other people's opinions to be heard and sometimes even defers to other people out of love. And gentleness only applies as much force to a given situation as is necessary. And gentleness strives for a win win and good for everyone on just a very practical level. Gentleness has fallen out of favor in so many ways in our world today. And that you may say, well, I don't know about that, but think about it this way. We, we have two, two sides, it seems like, that I see that have arisen in America in particular. You have either people who are just pushovers, right? Never stand for anything, whatever anybody else wants to do. That's not gentleness, that's weakness. But then the other side is just like brutality and outrage and anger and my way at any cost. And neither one of those are gentle. And so... What we're striving for is this middle way of saying, I have convictions, I have principles, I have things that I believe to be true, but I'm not going to kill other people to make sure that they know what I believe, right? When we don't respond to hate with hate. The world teaches us to, to get revenge for everything. That's one of the things that I see constantly. It's just this kind of quiet undercurrent. But 
think about most modern movies today. And I'm not necessarily condemning movies, but just most of them have a, a little revenge plot line that runs through it. Almost always. That one of the climax points of most modern movies is when some character finally gets their revenge. And maybe it's violent or maybe it's just, you know, that they finally get what they deserve. Whatever. But that's what we're being preached to constantly. And yet the Bible says, you better pray that you don't get what you deserve. And you better not want that for other people either. The world teaches us to return evil for evil. But the Bible says return good for evil. Pay back evil with good. Or like cancel culture. right? Where just this graceless thing where we just... You, somebody makes one mistake, kill them, basically. Kill them socially. That's what canceling is. You socially execute someone. But the Bible doesn't do that. It offers grace upon grace. And it also means we don't fire mean-spirited pot shots at people either because we want to be gentle. We want to bring people to our side. We're trying to win souls from Satan, not to destroy them along the way. And so then we wonder why the world is falling apart when everybody treats each other that way. Here's what Jesus said about gentleness. Matthew 5, 5, he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And that word translated meek is praus, which comes straight from the same root as prautes. Like those are obviously almost the same word. And so what Jesus is saying here is the inheritance of the world belongs to those who can control and contain themselves and who can genuinely care about the needs and perspectives of other people. And those who have strong convictions and yet express them in a way that is winsome rather than destructive. Those who they can be gentle in a proud and angry world are going to rule it one day. That's us, we hope. Right? That's what we are hoping toward. We will be the ones who sit beside the throne of Christ, who is the Prince of Peace and the most gentle man who ever lived to help him usher in a new age. And with that thought in mind, Jesus is the most gentle man who ever lived, which is true. Jesus is the exemplar of every single virtue that we are called to live. And so looking at the life of Christ, we see that gentleness in action. Jesus wasn't a pushover by any means. But he was, for example, the woman caught in adultery, right? She's about to be stoned by the rightful ruling of the law. Except Jesus sees something wrong with the picture. And I think he recognizes, wait, we've brought a woman who's been caught in adultery and there's no man with her. What's going on here? And he recognizes the injustice and they're getting ready, the Pharisees, to stone this woman. And he says, whoever has no sin, in other words, whichever one of you has not done something like this, you can go ahead and kill her first. And they all leave. As I think he writes their sins in the sand. That's gentleness. Not weakness. Not brutality. Right? Jesus could have just like killed them all with lightning if he wanted to. He's God. But he doesn't. He's gentle. In the same way, the woman who brings the jar of perfume, the prostitute who breaks it on Jesus' feet and washes his feet with her hair. And he's in the home of a Pharisee and they're all there together. And the Pharisees are watching this thing happen. They're like, don't you know who this woman is? And Jesus, rather than saying, y'all shut up, which he could have said and probably rightfully, maybe. He says, he who has been forgiven much loves much. And they're all just kind of like shocked because this is the same Jesus who has loudly and publicly called out their sins in front of everybody in the temple square because they were putting burdens on people by making up laws and adding to the law of God. And so Jesus, who was kind with sinners who needed his kindness, was also very harsh with those who needed his harshness. And that's really what gentleness is, is being able to recognize when and where to use your strength so that you can get what is best for people. Not what they deserve, not what you want them to get necessarily, but what is actually best, because that's what God does for us. And then related to this, verse 2 says, we also ought to walk with patience, bearing with one another in love. So, a worthy walk, in number three, is patient patient. A worthy walk is patient. This is a hard one. 
Because particularly what he's talking about here is not just patient waiting on the promises of God. He's talking about patience with other people. Because he says with patience, and then he describes what that patience looks like, which is bearing with one another in love. The King James, instead of the word patience, uses the word long-suffering. Maybe you know that word, long-suffering. Which was an old word that we don't use much anymore, but it captures something really important about the nature of patience. And that is that patience sometimes means we suffer a long time without blowing up, without getting even, without becoming bitter. And that is very hard to do. That is very hard to do. That we bear with one another in love. And bearing with somebody means you're either annoyed or upset or frustrated or offended and yet you don't lash out at them. That is what that means, to bear with somebody. You, you stick it in, you stick in with them, you stick in there so that they know that they're loved, even in the midst of their annoyingness and their frustratingness and all of those things. Of all of these virtues, patience is the one that is most often used to describe God as well. Because God bears with us quite a bit. Romans 2, 4, for example, says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And what I want you to really just see there is this idea that God's patience is rich and kind, that he is slow to anger, that he waits and gives us chance after chance to repent. Some people accuse God of being too slow, right? People say, well, why would God let this happen? Why would God let this person do this horrible thing? And the answer is the same reason that God allows each of us to wake up every morning after a previous day of sin. And it's because he is patient and rich in patience and kind That he wants us to do the right thing and he wants to give us more and more chances to do it. That is what the cross has bought for us, is the opportunity to do better tomorrow. And that's what we're supposed to give to other people. Here's Psalm 86, 15. It says this of God, You, O Lord, are a merciful and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So we have to be patient too. There will be a time of reckoning and judgment. We're not waiting forever. God is going to deal with every sin, either by punishing the sinner or by covering that offense in the blood of Christ. And our hope when we're patient with people is that they would change, that they would come to meet God and put their faith in Him and become people that we wouldn't even recognize, filled with the Holy Spirit, made new in Christ. And so we're called to be patient. And not just patient with sinners, and not just patient, well, we're all sinners, not just patient with people who are lost, but patient with each other too. We, We bear with each other's faults and flaws because we recognize God is making me new just like he's making everybody else new. And then all of these These three that we've just mentioned, humility, gentleness, and patience, all serve number four, which is that a a worthy walk is unified. Unified. And maybe I'm stretching that because I wanted to just get the one word there. Unified. Here's what I mean. He says that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that's a pretty thick and loaded phrase. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So there's a unity of the Spirit. So what he's talking about here then is the church, right? The church of Jesus should be unified. And we should be eager to maintain that unity because that unity has to be maintained. By the way, unity in a church or in the church of God is something that has to be constantly worked on. It's like a house, like a brand new house. You can imagine if you've ever been in a house that has literally just been finished, you know that it will not stay just brand new finished for very long, right? As soon as somebody moves in, or even if nobody moves in, that house starts to decay. That's how life works. Things start to break, right? Pipes start to leak, or 
the switch is broken, or nature is trying to move into the roof via squirrels or vines or whatever it might be. And we have to maintain it. If you live in a house, you know, all right, squirrels got in the attic, kill the squirrels, patch the roof, okay, maintained. And if you don't, you know what happens. The squirrels eat the wires, they get into the walls, they pee everywhere, the roof starts to leak. And in the same way, the church, the unity of the spirit has to be maintained and we should be eager to be maintaining it. And it says the way that we do that is in the bond of peace. Again, that we're striving for peace. And what, what that looks like, I think, most of all is that in a church, any church, fires can pop up, right? You have a conflict and they, there's a fire. And again, just, just like that house, if something is on fire in the house, you don't just ignore it, right? You have to deal with it. You've got to maintain the bond of peace. You've got to maintain the unity of the spirit. You've got to put the fire out so that the unity can thrive. So let's talk really quickly about what Christian unity doesn't mean, and then we'll talk about what it does mean. Because I hear a lot of talk about unity in the church, and it's usually good, but sometimes people have a slightly wrong idea. It's like this unity at all costs kind of thing. Like we have to include every, every group that calls itself a church, we've got to make sure we're unified with them. And it's like, no, 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 hold on. That's not right. Because Christianity doesn't mean, and Christian unity doesn't mean that we all have the same opinions it doesn't mean we all have the same perspectives. It doesn't have to mean we have all the same tastes or the same theological positions or be in the same church building or local church together, right? We're talking about a, a unity that's bigger than just our church. And so we don't want to divide over things that don't matter, but we also don't want to make, we don't want to include things that we shouldn't. We'll get to that in a minute. So here's, here's what Christian unity does mean. Here are the things we should unify around. So we're not unified around tastes or opinions or perspectives or specific niche theological positions, those kind of things. We are unified around these things that he lists. He says there is one body. There is one spirit. We have one hope. There is one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have one faith and one baptism. And there is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Those are the things that we unify around. And the truth is we have a lot of unity and we should have a lot of unity in those things. It's one of the most amazing things to me about church and about especially a local church is you end up loving people and best friends with people who you don't have much else in common with otherwise. People who if you met them out in the world you probably wouldn't know them beyond just a passing glance or whatever. But because of these things, because we all have the same spirit, because we have the same hope and the same Lord and we believe the same things and we've all shared in this thing called baptism and we worship the same God and Father, we are able to be unified in a way that the world looks at and it just doesn't make sense. But we understand because... We recognize that our faith in Christ and our hope that we share in a new and better world, that our, our love for God is more important than anything else. Psalm 133.1 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. And that's not just talking about the church necessarily, but it certainly includes the church. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. There are things worth dividing over, by the way. Here's an example from 1 Timothy. The Apostle Paul writing to the young pastor Timothy, he says this, basically, make sure you're holding faith and a good conscience because by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So he's not saying anybody who calls themselves a Christian, you should make sure you're unified with them. Because they thought they were, they thought they were in the faith, in the church. They had a position of authority, it seems like. And Paul says these men were dangerous. And so here are the things that I think are worth dividing over. If we shouldn't divide over opinions and perspectives and tastes and, and third order issues of theology, we should be dividing over things that threaten the unity of the spirit 
things that threaten the truth about God and the truth about the gospel. We should be dividing over things where people look at clear passages of Scripture and say, we don't have to follow that anymore. Right? Those are the things that should divide us because those things threaten the unity of the church. And what happens is if you have a pretend unity where you just include any and everybody who says, I'm a Christian, then you end up without any unity at all. To again, to go back to the illustration of the house that needs to be maintained. If you just open the doors wide open and leave the windows up all the time, pretty soon you don't have a house that's been maintained anymore. You can do your very best, but nature is going to come in and ruin. Right? You leave all the doors and windows open and a good storm comes through, you have a huge mess to clean up. And so in the same way, the church churches should have doors. We should have windows. Doors that can be opened to people who we want to welcome in, but also doors to help us recognize this is our house and it doesn't belong to everybody. We can have unity in here without having to welcome in all comers. Now, again, we want to make sure that we set the doors in the right way and we want to exclude the right things and include the right things. But unity does not mean, does not mean that we throw away all the things that make us distinct and different. And it doesn't mean that we let any and all things in and lose our identity completely. But it does mean we rally around our one Lord. We rally around the Bible. We rally around the truth and the gospel and the convictions that we share together. And we allow those things to unify us even when lesser things threaten to divide us. That's what that means. And that we should be eager to maintain that unity, to do whatever we can to keep that unity together. Paul tells Titus something else similar. He says that uh, you should warn a divisive person once and then twice. And then after that, have nothing else to do with him, knowing that such a person is self-deceived and dangerous. The division is a serious thing and we should be always striving to kill division, to unify together. Because that is a walk that is worthy of the Lord who has called us. Let me hit all these one more time. A worthy walk is these four things. Maybe not just these four things, but this is a good place to start. A worthy walk is humble. We humble ourselves before God and other people. A worthy walk is gentle. We are supposed to be gentle and kind, only using force when it is necessary, and yet never shying away from the truth. We are supposed to be patient. A worthy walk is patient. We bear with one another in love. And then we strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And the awesome thing is, Jesus has set us an amazing example of what that looks like. And not just that, but now Christ dwells in us, in our hearts, to make us into a person like this. And so this morning, if you feel like you're struggling with these things, first of all, you're not alone. I don't know if any of us has arrived and gotten all four of these things down right. I don't think so. We're all striving toward that. But my encouragement to you is to keep striving. Keep striving. Keep killing your pride. Keep humbling yourself. We have an active role to play. Strive to be gentle, to control your tongue, to control your anger, to control your yourself. To be patient with people, to bear with them. Patience is like a muscle that strengthens over time. I've experienced that, and I think probably you have too. And then strive to maintain the unity of the church, to put out those fires of conflict and bitterness and frustration and anger as they arise, whether that's in your own heart or in relationships that you have. Strive for unity around the gospel and the truth. We strive for these things God has promised that he will accomplish them in us, that he who began a good work in us will see it to completion at the day of Christ. Let me pray for us. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you have loved us, that you have called us to walk in your marvelous light, to live these holy lives, to be a set-apart people, to be ambassadors of your truth and your glory and your love. Lord, we ask today that 
you would help us to be patient and gentle and humble and unified. That we would never compromise the truth. That we would never compromise what we know to be true. That we would never compromise our convictions according to your word. But that you would, through those things, unify us to one another. That you would help us as we understand to be more patient like you have been patient with us. To be gentle like you have been gentle with us. To be humble as we recognize that we have been saved by a grace that we could never deserve. Lord, if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you or who is far from you or whose faith is still in themselves or in something else, God, I ask today that you would open their eyes to see your goodness and your truth and your glory, to see their need for a Savior and to recognize that Jesus died and rose again to rescue them from their sins. And Lord, I ask today that you would give them the faith, compel them to believe and save them from their sins. Remake them in Christ for a new and better world. Lord, and help us all to live out the calling that you have called us to. To somehow strive to be worthy of a grace we could never earn or deserve. We love you, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.